you're in the e-commerce space and you have more than let's say 100 customers, which is basically everybody who has a proven model for e-commerce, you actually already have a community. You're just not tending to it. So just go send out a message and, and let people know where they can go to join. Give them a Facebook group or give them a WhatsApp thread. Give them something ultra personal. How fun is it when you actually get to engage with like founders and other members and other users? And then watch that be the gift that continues to give. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns. This is the show we share cutting edge strategies for directors of marketing, CMOs, business owners to get more sales leads, grow their business to ultimately achieve their vision. And today it's just me and Kasim. It's just like no Neil Patel, no Eric Sue, nobody to distract us, nobody to make fun of. Um, well, we can still make fun of people. I don't. Yeah, we. I'm not, I'm not prepared. We can make fun of each other. Way. I was, yeah. I was back listening to that episode. I like, you know, there was, there was a little bit of, you know, uh, there was a little bit of tension in the air, which I kind of liked <laughs> with, with, with those guys. It's like, you know, we, we, I think Neil is my guess. Cause he's like an OG internet marketer, SEO guy. I have a, yeah. I have a feeling like whenever anybody gets on a call with him, like they kind of kiss his ass. Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it was it was good. I think Eric Sue enjoyed it because he uh he realized that uh you know maybe Neil sometimes gets the notoriety, maybe that he doesn't get as like Eric's a super freaking smart guy. But I mean, talk about two brains. Uh well Neil's show. done the best job of anybody I know at self-promoting. Like his his oh. face is on everything. Everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just yeah. Talk about really using media buy to your benefit. Yeah. And when you become a brand, Alex Ramosi talked about this. He had this great, I think it was a TikTok reel. And he talked about how he realized um, looking at celebrities selling alcohol. Yeah. You know, how come The Rock's able to make a billion dollars on his tequila brand? It's not like his tequila is anything special. And it's because he yeah. had a brand. And so Hermosi goes, so I did, you know, and Hermosi, you can almost tell when you watch his content. He doesn't want to be doing this. But he realized that's what was going to move the needle for him. So, you know, it's a, that's kind of a, a Trojan pro tip for our listeners, especially if you're doing a bunch of media buys. There's no reason not to put your face on things. You know, like John and I spend or we have been spending 250 grand a month in YouTube. And dude, it's crazy how often people come up to me now and they're like, oh, I know you, you know, yeah. just in weird random. It was at the locker room and the village in Scottsdale. Like, huh? Uh, oddly enough, it wasn't as awkward as you'd think. But I was in my <laughs> towel post shower and some guy's like, hey, man, I, I know who you are. So. Uh, oh my god! So you're like, wait a second! You're in the locker room of your your what your sports club? Yeah, it was the, the country club. I'm in the <laughs> locker room. I just got out of the shower after my sauna, and some dude like spotted me. And um, I mean, that's not why you want to do it, right? Unless that's why you want to do it. No. But building a brand puts you in a position. You just have access to things you don't have access to otherwise. You can have conversations you wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. You know, people know who you are, and uh, it, especially in today's day and age. That's a, a very special type of currency and it's, it's tradable. Yeah, it is. It, it, it actually speaks to what we're going to be talking about here today and trends. Uh, cause it, we're, we're going to talk about trends in digital marketing and e-commerce specifically, I think with a little bit of focus there. And one of the things that is not on this list is this very thing. And I've noticed that the brands that have a name or have a spokesperson attached to them, oftentimes because they either create community in advance, which is one of the things we'll talk about, but just having a face that goes along with the brand really helps, like not only on the marketing side, but it just lends a human element to what the thing that you're doing. You see it now with big brands that do it. You know, like mud water, you see them all the time, you know, with their founder's story about too much caffeine and right. he's painting and he's doing it like it's real, really effective ads. And that's just one example. That's somebody who sort of came up through the internet marketing ranks and now is gone brand. Like we've done presentations on this, like how did Athletic Greens and Kate Spade and these big, big brands become big brands it's because they did things that other people haven't done. In most cases, it's usually because of a celebrity. Like think of Kate Spade, think of The Rock, you know, think of George Clooney with, you know, I didn't realize like the tequila that I bought like 
you know, a couple of months ago from one of my buddies was George Clooney's. And did it made a billion together. dollars on that. You know, uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds has done it a couple of times. He had a drink. He he had Boost Mobile. Mint. Mint. Uh, is it Mint Mobile? Is it Mint Boost Mobile? Mobile? He's Mint got a mobile. mobile. I don't know which one yeah. it is. Yeah, he owns a he owns a marketing agency in Austin. Actually, my buddy Adam Lyons, who we've had Adam on this show, haven't we? I don't think so. If not, we should. He's a wicked smart marketer. But Adam pointed me towards uh, Ryan Reynolds marketing agencies like Core Thesis. Yep. And they do this newsjacking thing to where anything that happens today, they've shot an episode, they've shot an ad on it today. Yeah. So, you know, Kim Kardashian hits somebody's dog with her SUV, and they've shot an a parody ad within a couple of hours and it's somehow crazy. related that back to mint mobile. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Great. Uh, great book to read on that. If you're interested more in it is uh news jacking by David Meerman Scott, I believe. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, it's super good. Uh, it's like a how to guide on how to news jack. So oh, yeah, he's uh, got a whole website on it too. Newsjacking.com. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I haven't read it in a couple of years, but now that you mention it, it was it. We have done this to a small degree. It's like we're not as nimble, or it's not our mo. Like we produce content sort of that is evergreen, and but like you can't doubt the fact that this is like it, in the entire book. You could have been like, holy crap! There's dozens of examples of how it's been done. You probably haven't even realized that it's been done this way. And I would say Ryan Reynolds is a master of it. And plus. He's really good in the commercials. Oh, dude, you know, he's so funny. He's so funny. He's yeah. just, yeah. So having that, I do think, is a trend. And I think it's a it's a way in which you differentiate, whether it's a founder's story, whether it's, you know, the Mudwater guy, which is kind of a founder's story. He's, he's not a celebrity. You know, a, a celebrity being tied to a brand. Obviously, the Kardashians are great at this. You got the rock. You got plenty of examples there. You got Conor McGregor, not to be confused with Ewan McGregor, Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, Kasim, uh, with proper twelve. Like there is so many examples of this, and I think it definitely is a trend. As and as as a person once told me, it's like if you can be the nerd of your space and do all the research and be mm -hmm. the nerd that knows more about, you know, honey based moisturizers than anyone else on the planet. People will follow you because you're so nerded out about it. They will follow you and buy it because you've done all the research for them if your story is original, unique, and authentic. Yeah, Gary Vee did that with wine. Absolutely. What a weird so. guy. What a weird face for wine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Seriously. You'd expect like a gray beard, geriatric, or blue blood wasp, or like there, there's a collection of people that you would expect to be like the the spokesperson for wine. And then Gary Vee's just this foul mouth technophile trust fund baby who like just decided to start shooting YouTube videos about wine. It's true. And people loved him for it, man. It's unreal. He built a whole his brand, that's what's it's actually really interesting. This conversation comes full circle. His personal brand became way bigger than the wine brand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another great example, kids that um, my, my kids follow him all the time. And I now follow him. I mean, talk about a not a face for marketing is Casey Neustadt. I don't know who that is. Or Neistat. Sorry. I always get his, his pronunciation confused. He, he is a YouTube vlogger. Like he has a cinematic background, huge. Like he has commercials and ads, not like Mr. Beast level mm. involvement, but his brand, he has built up such brand equity, created a community that basically whatever it is that he pitches or he talks about people buy same kind of thing. But it, he is not a face you would ever think would be a successful spokesperson. It just goes to show you like, you don't have to be like, you don't have to have, you know, rock star uh, Hollywood good looks like Kasim Aslam to, <laughs> to pitch stuff. Clearly that's I mean, against me. You know, yeah, it's so you sad. Can, the suggestion you can look like me too. having been in an industrial accident and, you know, still sell stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> if you search Casey Neistat, the, one of the first suggestions is Casey Neistat teeth. <laughs> <laughs> which is a bunch of very unflattering pictures of his two right I'm like, bad. why? Who who does that? I don't know. I Google's know. a weird rabbit hole, time? man. 
<laughs> it really is. It's the strangest thing. So, all right. So we've got a couple of couple of nuggets in there uh, that <laughs> are, we will be talking about here today, getting into today's actual show, but definitely check out Newsjacking. Uh, we'll leave links in the show notes with an affiliate link, of course. So if you click on my Amazon, I make two cents. It's great, isn't that? Uh, no, but uh, seriously, it's actually, it's, it is a great book. And you also have a a nugget from a Driven member. This is one of the best things about this new mastermind that I'm in. Like, it costs a lot of money. Like, no offense. It's freaking expensive. And to get there four times a year, it's even more expensive. But a perpetual traffic listener that maybe doesn't have that kind of money that you and your money grubbing, uh, you know, greedy millionaire, uh, misfit, <laughs> uh, co-founders charge, you can get the benefit of that here at perpetual traffic. So I'm just trying to bring more and more value. Like, so today's tool is brought to you by a driven member and, uh, lay it on us. Yeah, I love that. I haven't heard of. Horrible money grubbing reputation precedes us. Uh, this comes from our buddy Murray Gray. Uh, not a paid promotion, incidentally. It's just something that I happened to cross. He did a demo for us, and we were all pretty blown away. Murray owns a product called Experiencify, and it's uh, spelt with an X, X Experiencify. And what's cool about it is it gamifies online courses, which, by the way, like, dear God in heaven, have we needed this forever. So if you have an online course, um, or to be honest with you, any info product, and you're seeing uh, people drop off in the completion of it, this solves that problem, which by the way, is every online course ever in the history of online courses. Uh, we worked with one of the largest LMSs in the world. And Ralph, the purchase to usage rates are, they're horrifying. Yeah. You know, in some industries, it's like 93% of online courses that are bought are never even started, not finished never even started. And so Experienceify is cool because it builds like real uh, gaming psychology into your online course. And, and, you know, forgive me for using this word. It's actually right on his website, but it makes it addictive. And, but if your online course is meant to help somebody, then that's a, that's a powerful and positive addiction. Um, and yeah, he's got, he actually has that statistic cited right on his website too. 97% of people who purchase your course are unlikely to ever complete it. Yeah. Um, and we have something of a responsibility to people that buy things from us to make sure that they actually get value from those things. I so, believe so. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's pretty damn cool. Um, all things said and done. And, uh, you know, if you've got an online course or, um, or thinking about an online course, this is, this is a great place to start. Go to experienceify.com. So it doesn't create the content for you. It makes, it ensures that the content is consumed by gamifying the process. Correct. Of it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And it uses like, you know, PhD level gamification science. Um, and he's got a ton of case studies too. That's part of what he was sharing with us. There's like 10,000 course creators that have used it. Um, and there's all these different trigger points and um, just like they've really thought through how this can and should work. Uh, if you go to the website, he's got all these, the triggers are explained throughout, which is kind of cool too. You know, it's really, even if you don't have a course, it's a good lesson. Just scrolling through the website is a good lesson in the thought logic behind gamification. Mm -hmm. So this would be like an alternative to a Thinkific or Kajabi or Teachable, those guys. Yeah, because Kajabi and Teachable will help you sort of outline the course itself. You still have to create all the content. I know... I know for a fact that Kajabi and both, you know, you guys and we actually did courses for Kajabi. So we're huge fans of Kajabi, but Kajabi right now is in the process of actually creating a way in which to create the course using AI. I think it's in a beta right now, but I think you're going to see a lot of that coming out. I know we have a common friend who, who does that as well, which we'll talk about probably on a later show. But the point is, is like, how do you get people to actually consume it? That's right. the issue. Yeah, And it goes back to what Tony Robbins used to say back when I'd listen to like cassette tapes in my Ford Taurus driving around is 99% of the people when you buy like a cape, you know, the tape series, like unlimited power, you really say 99% of people don't even take the cellophane off the box. And congratulations for, to you. Like he says that in like the first tape, I was like, huh, this is before I knew anything about like marketing or info products or whatever. But the point is, is like, if you're not 
helping your buyer consume, you're doing them a disservice. Mm-hmm. And you're doing your brand a disservice too. Because it's like, at the end of the day, isn't it about, I don't know, not to sound corny here, but actually helping people and fulfilling on the promise that you actually promised delivering. to them? Well, and yeah. you know, if you want to make it self-serving, the other piece of it is they're more likely to buy the next time if they actually consumed the first time. Yeah, you know it's exponentially cheaper to resell an existing customer than sell a new customer. All the data supports that and has forever. Of course. So if you can help your existing customers, that's worth something. That's worth backtracking too. Go back, go back to people that bought from you and never really benefited, and help them benefit. And you know, talk about a phenomenal well from which you can draw upon forever. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, there you go. You got a couple of nuggets here before we even get into the content of today's show. Uh, we are going to get into, I don't know how many of these trends. We're going to get through as many as we possibly can. I think we've got like 13 here. We're going to do our so, best. Yeah, we're going to do our best to get through as many as we possibly can with probably some ad-libbing on the way. But these are things to help shape your marketing as well as especially from an e-commerce standpoint because we've got a lot of people to listen to this show about e-commerce. Uh, it's one of the things that, um, you know, we do really well at tier 11. I know you guys do an excellent job at solutions eight with that. We are going to get into those trends right after this quick break. So stick around. All right, so we are back. We're going through uh, however many we get through. <laughs> My guess is probably four or five. We're going to do probably a, a part two of this as well. Is uh, e-commerce and digital marketing trends that will shape your marketing in 2024. So one of the big things, and this seems, I'm going to throw a big cost some 25 cent word here. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, watch it. Uh, this seems anathema to say that traffic is your least important part of your marketing right now. Counterintuitive, almost sacrilegious because we are a perpetual traffic. It's the name of the show. It's the sexy part. It's the thing that people want. But what I find is when we do, we probably do, you know, 10 audits a week for businesses. They always think they have a traffic problem. And yes, I know we've talked about this before many times, like all the traffic in the world does not cure a crappy offer. You're just throwing, you know, crap on crap. If that's right. the case, Water it's your offer is the key. Yeah. Uh, feeding a, 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 a leaky bucket. So, but the traffic component, and I'm not talking about just that, like, so there is that part of it. Yes, the offer is important, but the traffic part of it is not the thing that's so important now because it's being commoditized. And if we look forward a year, two years, three years, like the AI and the platforms right now, we've had Cameron Campbell on here. We've had John Moran on here. We've had uh, Kobe Topaz on here, like guys that are in hands-on tools every single day. We're seeing AI and the platforms themselves start to be able to allow the best media buyers to do better work, but also the ones who maybe don't really know what they're doing quite as well, just sort of hands off. Yeah. The in-app and, optimization is actually starting. And I, it's not, it's not new, right? I mean, we've been, I, one of my favorite examples is we had a client whose account we hadn't touched in seven months. No, zero change history. We did some feed optimizations, but zero change history. And we reached out to him on a, on a pretty regular basis. And we're like, Hey, dude, you sure you still want to pay us to just sit here and watch this thing? And what was sure. funny is for a really long time, he was like, yeah, actually, I just want you to keep an eye on it. It's it's worth it for me for that and to be able to call you and to get my reporting. And then one day he goes, you know, I guess I really can just do this myself, yeah. um, which is dangerous for agencies. But for customers, I think everybody's starting to kind of see that depending on the type of business you're in and the amount of tweaking you need, you know, that that, like you're saying, Ralph, the traffic just might, it's not that it's not important. It's that it's it's just not as hard as it used to be. It used to be like when we launched this show, it was all about traffic and all the new things and the ways to get around 
the algorithm and to hack them and to, oh, well, you know, back then it was, oh, Facebook tells you to do this, but here's what really works. Here's right. the inside secrets. There's less and less of that now. No, I think now the real place for the media buyer, this is the, you know, at Solutions 8, we had to make a pivot because we got nailed by this exact problem. The value proposition is the comparative analysis between traffic channels. So if you're just managing one traffic channel, then I think that you're going to be replaced by the AI yesterday. Uh, what agencies should look at doing too, um, it, I actually learned this term from our, one of our strategists, Glenn, one of the sharpest guys I've ever known. Uh, it's the analysis of covariance. And if you can see like, the, here's how meta impacts Google if and when you roll in TikTok, except when there's been, you know, like trying to figure out because the in-app metrics can't really be trusted when you're running multiple channels. And so I think that's the space for an agency. But uh, other than that, it's, you know, if you're just myopic in scope and view, uh, we've been pretty well out optimized. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a less relevant topic because, I mean, like we, <clears throat> we now have a we're redoing our website by the time this goes live, it might actually be live. We're redoing our website where traffic used to be a huge portion of like this overall system that we use. And it's now it's since outdated. It's since outdated really within the last year or two. But traffic is always going to be a component for sure because it's the gasoline you can throw on the fire to make the fire bigger. Mm. Great. But a lot of that is automated. And w what we found is that if you look at at marketing in general or digital marketing in general, we sort of look at it as four pillars like in basic terms. It's your creative, it's your traffic, it's your after the click, all tied together with data. And data is everything that you can possibly pull from third-party attribution softwares, from GA4, from your source of truth, which is actually your CRM where you collect your money or your merchant account, whatever it happens to be. All those things work in concert together. And as we are putting this graphic together, tr the traffic gear in this, what we refer to as the conversion machine, was the smallest gear. Yeah, it shrinks. It shrinks. It used to be the biggest gear. And I think that's now changed. And I think that is... Uh, certainly a trend. I think that a lot of folks, I'm starting to see that realization occur. What I'm seeing more and more is, you know, siloed, uh, the, the, the siloification of traffic, which has always existed is still a problem that a lot of businesses have. Like, for example, we've got a brand that has four different agencies for four different channels, social, email, Google, and I don't, they're not really even doing YouTube, and then uh, after the click. And none of those four silos talk to each other, but they yeah, all are they, telling they fight. Them. Why would they? Because they yeah. are all claiming credit for the last click attribution. Whereas I think the smart businesses now say, okay, well... You need a holistic view of this because traffic, there's no one, like we talked about this in a few episodes back with you and, and you know, your keynote speech at, at, at TNC is that those lines are blurred now. You mm -hmm. have to be able to look at things from a holistic view as opposed to just looking at it channel by channel by channel. And I know we might be beating a dead horse here if you've been listening to the show or watching the show at any length of time, but it's so much more important now than it ever has been. Word, word to the mother. <clears throat> so uh, trend number two, this is a big one for you. You found this to be the case. This is my favorite soapbox is I think the future of all things digital marketing is community. I think that's especially true in e-commerce since this is what this episode about is about, right? The 10 e-commerce trends that will shape your marketing in 2024. And I think if you're not building community around your products, you're missing out on a huge lever. And the nice thing about community is it actually builds itself because in our, you know, strange commerce driven world, people define themselves by what they buy and what they use. And you know this because people use stickers. You ever notice that? Mm. You send somebody a sticker. Bro, I, I, saw, I see people with like stickers of the coffee they drink on their laptop case. You know, so that's that's a really small and kind of benign way of sort of identifying the community. But I think if you build a community around your products, um, you put people in a position to sort of 
attach their identity to it. And I don't know that there's anything more powerful because from a retention standpoint, you know, if I buy your product because I like it, that's a whole lot different than I buy your product because I identify myself with somebody who uses your product. And the, the cliche example of this is Apple, but there's a billion more. You know, Tesla's done a really good job at this too. It, it, people don't just buy Tesla for Tesla any longer. They buy Tesla so they can be a part of this Tesla community. Um, and there are smaller brands that have done this really well. I, I think the, the, the plunge.com people did a good job at this. Not that I'm recommending them incidentally, because my plunge broke down seven times in nine months. Uh, but <laughs> it was unreal, dude. And their support is interesting at absolute best. However, as, uh, as exactly pissy as I am rave, with them. Rave recommendation there. Yeah. Um, don't buy plunge. But they did a really good job. And this is how they suckered me into buying from them, you know, even with sort of a faulty product, is there's so many people posting about themselves using the plunge. And it's kind of this thing where it becomes a part of your identity, um, you know, and everybody wants to be the, the virtue signaler showing themselves in 39 degree water. And so you get all these social posts and you tag yourself in it. I even did it. You know, they've got 200 some odd thousand followers and um, you post yourself using the plunge and then they'll shout you back out saying, hey, good job or whatever. Like there's this huge community built around ice baths and cold plunges. And, uh, you know, they've, they've done a good job at building a community around this, this endeavor. And they've even kind of talking about news jacking, they've jacked other people's community. So like the Wim Hof community and the cold exposure community have all, they get to play into that too. So it's not even that you necessarily have to build the community. You can go borrow from other people's if you have a product that's directly applicable. You know, if you're looking at co-centric circles, there's no reason not to, to draw on those communities. So uh, it's it's weird because even with a product that I would consider to be second rate or faulty, they own the industry because they own the community. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty insane. We recently bought a rowing machine, or I bought one for my wife, and now I use now it. Now I have to use it. <laughs> now I have to use it, and I mean it's. Uh, I don't know if I, I haven't fallen in love with it as of yet, but they created a community around this machine and uh, well, I'll leave a link in the show notes here for it. If you're not familiar with it, it's Peloton like, but not really like Uber competitive, like Peloton, but Peloton being a great example of another community, a great community. Absolutely. Yeah. Like there are people that are so devoted to this. Yep. It's like my ne my niece and nephew like live right down the street and they are on the Peloton every single day and they are competing against this community of people. And they now know these people from all over the country because they compete against them. And then, of course, there's – I don't know what it is for Peloton. I think it's a Facebook group. But there's a Facebook group for Hydro, you know, which is the, the company, the, the rower that we bought. And I – I'm watching kind of like, I've only used it a couple of times and I'm like, this is brilliant. And it, you know, as you're rowing, there's messages that pop up and yep. you know, you've got this overly enthusiastic instructor, like actually on like a river, like the Charles river in Boston and you know, in, in springtime, but they've created this whole community. So many prompts it's like join our community, join our community, join our community. And of course I'm like, I'm not joining another freaking community. But there's tens of thousands of people in this thing. And it's like it's the world's best-selling uh, rowing machine. I mean, they've got 9,800 practically five-star, four-star reviews on, on Trustpilot. And they did it at the same time by selling a product. They created mm -hmm. the community while they sold it. And I think that's what makes people stick. Uh, I'm not buying into it yet because I'm a little bit more on the skeptical side. I'd rather go to the gym and lift weights. But the point is, is I get it and I understand well, dude, it. You even kind of nailed it there a little bit though. You're not their ideal avatar for that community. Like right. you're, you're a, a powerlifting guy who happens to have a rower because you bought it for your wife. And I think that that speaks to the, the power of community. It, it sort of attracts and repels if you're doing it right. Right. You know, it right. attracts and repels and you get your ideal avatar in there. And, and you mentioned the reviews. That's a great way to do social proof. You, if you need social proof, go to your community. You need case Absolutely. studies, go to your community. You need testimonials. You need user-generated content. Like all that shit is impossibly hard to get your hands on when you're asking customers. 
Yeah. When you're asking community members, that's what the community's for. And the community is not impossibly hard to build. You just have to tell people where to go. You know, join this thread, join this group, sign up for this thing, tag this hashtag, like give them one very small step towards just opting in. And then, and then from there it kind of, and you know, you know what that is based off of context and a community can be built around anything. We have a client who's a very large salsa brand. And one of the things that they do is they get people to submit like their unique and creative recipes. Yeah. And people love the shit out of being able to do that, dude, because yeah. the people that use this type of salsa are so creative just in general. And they're submitting all these like unique things that they did. And, and then they highlight them from within the community. And then they kind of become nerd famous in this little microcosm. Yep. And But they let people know where to go to do that. And that's how you build that community up. So I, I think the fact that you haven't opted into this community in a weird idiosyncratic way speaks to the power of community in general, because they don't want you in there, dude. They don't want, You're not they going to talk want. about rowing. You're going to tell everybody yeah. to go to the gym and lift weights. Like, look at all you you skinny people. Yeah. Like, come on. You're burning uh, calories. What I you? know. Come on, man. You should be adding like lean muscle. Now, in the last example, like that is a case where Hydro did it in, uh, you know, in sync with the sale of the product. Hmm. I've seen a lot of brands, one in particular who we just spoke with yesterday, like they created this one guy, like created uh, a community on YouTube, 728,000 uh, followers on YouTube, one and a half million on Instagram, you know, 14, 1500 videos on YouTube, created this incredible community for guys like the ages of 15 to 25, maybe 30. And just showed them how to work out in this new way of doing it. Talk about like muscle building and strength and all this sort of stuff on a three day routine with intermittent fasting and reverse pyramid training and all these sort of things. You're like, huh? And he created this community and then started selling programs. Mm. So he did all the videos, did all the work up front, and now he's selling supplements, which is, and he sells other things like, you know, which workout. The highest bonuses. margin product in the world. Highest margin. Like, like it's a. Dear God. He, he did such an incredible job and unfortunately his agencies don't know what the hell they're doing. But the point is, is like they built that community in advance. Look at Facebook. Great example. Built community, got mm. like a billion people on board and then boom. Eh, I don't think it was a billion. It was probably about half, half a million, 800,000 or, or uh, 800 million rather. And then started selling advertising. Right. It wasn't, as soon as you started, sell advertising, build the community first. This does require patience. And in his case, it well, requires a lot of venture capital funding. Right. Yeah. But it, yeah. So, but it's, we know it's worth it because look at, have you seen all these newsletters that are selling now? Oh, it's insane. For I know un Curry's unbelievable multiples. Yeah. yeah. But that's because everybody knows how valuable these communities really are. Yeah. There's a bunch of newsletter sort of devotees in the, in the driven group. Which is yeah. which is fascinating. Like that's an old school thing. Like Perry Marshall, yeah, he was on a couple of episodes ago. Like that's how he makes a, a lot of his money. Like a lot of his. Well, I'm a subscriber revenue. to his newsletter. It's great. Yeah, and it's great. He's an amazing writer. The point is, is like he's created a community, and you can do it in concert with a product launch. But I think if you have the capability to be able to do it in advance of, and then you figure out what your product should be. In a lot of cases, right? Well, the, the, your that's the other thing that's really cool is your community, community will, will tell, tell you. you. Yeah. yeah. Here's what we want from you. So especially true in e-commerce. If you're not doing that, if you don't have a Facebook group at the very least, this is something that we have dozens of customers in both e-commerce and in info products who have done this. And it's just like, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Here's and the way I'd you, love for people to think about it. If you're in the e-commerce space and you have more than, let's say, 100 customers, which is basically everybody who has a proven model for e-commerce, you actually already have a community. You're just not tending to it. So just go sound out a message and, and let people know where they can go to join. Yeah. You know, like Ralph is saying, give them a Facebook group or give them a WhatsApp thread. Give them something ultra personal. How fun is it when you actually get to engage with like founders and other members and other users? And it's then cool. watch that be the gift that continues to give. Like it'll be a little costly in some ways because it's going to require time to tend to, but not an insane amount of time. Think about how valuable that is to an e-commerce brand that maybe oh, is dude. not, you know, an I know SUPS or a right. AG1 at this point, but small and you're growing. 
Like what better market research can you get by having a WhatsApp thread or a Slack oh, thread? Like then that, like direct yeah, what contact flavor do you want next? with what your products customers. Should we do? Here's three different options that we have. What are you guys thinking? Like, and then when people participate in the creation of things, they're almost required to buy, you know, it's like, yeah. yeah. And you know, they're going to, cause they feel, they feel a sense of ownership over it. Yeah. I bet we could go on and on about this. Like there's various stages of this, but so small, medium, large, really, if you're small, just start something. Yeah. Or, you know, if you have a list, you have a hundred customers say, you know, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this thing with a community on WhatsApp. Do you, would you join? Right. You know, maybe just, testing out the waters or creating it and saying, Hey, you got direct access to me for, you know, your, whatever it is. Like my wife just bought like this new kind of soap and there is like a Facebook group around it. I'm forgetting the name of it. It has like something to do with like beeswax and then something from Jamaica. And she's like, Oh, it's the greatest stuff ever. Hmm. And they have a, they, of course they have a Facebook community, but imagine if that brand was just launching, what kind of market Intel they could get from my wife. Hmm amazing so and it's it's all it, it's going to cost you is time in most cases your time and what better way to launch a brand and to grow a business than do it that way and of course you know once you get to the scale of a hydro or you know a facebook it's a whole other thing and obviously community is a big part of that uh so i think we have <laughs> we have we have landed the the rocket ship on that one uh, we used to say we landed the plane. Now we land the rocket ship. That's what we say inside Tier 11 now because of Elon Musk. What's your next one? If we can get to one more here before uh, we're out on today's episode. So just for the listeners, this is based off of a blog that's going to be dropping at Tier 11's website. So if you want to hear all 10 or want to read all 10, make sure to check out the blog and we'll link to that in the show notes. Um, we're doing maybe the highlights and the last one that I think is worthy on touching on is, is tracking. Uh, the future of tracking is dubious at best. And I think that people, not I think, I know for a fact, I'm willing to stake my life on this, Ralph. Uh, brands will stop focusing so heavily on in-app tracking and are going to begin looking at um, broader data sets, trying to identify correlative values uh, and paying better attention to interactive trends between different tracking sources. What does that mean? Well, it's something that we've been championing for a long time. I, I, I've said, and man, I was so wrong about this. Uh, I said for the longest time that attribution is a trillion dollar problem. And anybody who can crack the code on attribution is going to, you know, just mint money. And the reason I was wrong about it is because it turns out it's an unsolvable problem because it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder and more and more opaque. And so instead of, you know, attribution is the lead indicator. And so if you think you're going to be able to track clicks and impressions, you're wrong. You were just flat out wrong and there's no way to do it, period. And, and that's actually a conversation I'm willing to have with somebody. So if there's a, a data scientist out there who wants to argue that point with me, please submit to Perpetual Traffic. You can go to perpetualtraffic.com forward slash better and let us know who we should be interviewing on this because I, I, I have my very strong opinions and I'm, I, my business was purchased by a $700 million MarTech agency that has some of the smartest AI people in the world on this problem. And we've been explained in no uncertain terms as to why this is just impossible. Um, attribution tracking specifically. And so instead of attribution, what you want to do is data analysis, which is the lag indicator. And so this is something like what Wicked Reports does, where it goes in and it says, what has happened? And then how can we connect those, those actions? And so it's, uh, to put it in simplest terms, my Google bottom of funnel campaign improved in efficacy by two to three X. Well, if you're just looking at an app, that's great. Give Google more money. But what you might not realize is, I don't know, 70 days ago, your Facebook top of funnel campaign, you increased the budget for. And the right correlation would be, oh, when I increase my Facebook top of funnel, my Google top of funnel improves two and a half months later. And that's not something that we're good at looking at as marketers. 
especially when it gets more complex than the, the two point correlation I just offered within a 90 day time span, right? Because you have to think it has to be multivariant, broader time zones, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that the tracking needs to be much more sophisticated in terms of oversight and it's going to get far less sophisticated in terms of our ability to actually capture some of this information because it's actively being taken away from us by every network on a daily basis. Yep. Yep. True. I think bottom line with this is that, uh, this is a quote that you say, everybody lies, right? <laughs> everybody lies. And if you look at all the apps, all the platforms, they all lie. They really do. And if you're looking at that siloed, you're screwed. Right. Because you're going to be robbing Peter to pay Paul. But if you do use a secondary source, what we found is that there are secondary sources. There are third-party attribution softwares, but it's not pure attribution. Like you're never going to get this right. You're never going to get it exact. You're just, it's not going to happen because every third-party attribution software is all click-based. Right. Well, they have too. to be. There's no they way to, to capture impression-based data. If you can figure out that, that's like, that's the next generation. Yeah, but who would I give think. that to you? You know, like in order to get the impression-based data, you'd have to get it from the apps and they don't want you to have it because they actually don't want you to be able to tell where they're inefficient. I've spoken to some founders of some third-party attribution softwares. They say it's actually possible. Haven't seen it yet. Mm, oh, I don't know. Haven't man. seen that, it yet. Yeah. All right. So that's that's the next frontier. That's Star Trek, the next frontier. Here's the other piece too, is it's, even if it's it were, going to be modeled no matter what. It would it would be a privacy violation. You couldn't get impression based data and tether that to a user ID without overstepping all the new regulations. Uh, I'm just telling you what I've, what I, the man, conversations I'd, I've I'd had. I'd be excited <laughs> if that ended up being true, but I am skeptical. Well, good. I think there, I think there has to be some healthy skepticism here. I do think that third-party attribution software is like Wicked Reports, for example. We both, you know, are investors in uh, Northbeam. I'm an investor in Wicked Reports. Yeah, so I'm a fan I'm of Wicked Reports. I like yeah. what they do, but it's Absolutely. it's really it's post data analysis is my it understanding is. of it, which yeah, I actually absolutely. think is the more appropriate approach. Dude, for sure. Because it's, it's, it's no, you're not guessing at the truth. You're like, here's what happened. Let's try here's to figure what out what, what that means. Right. Yeah. Right. And there's some new features that are coming down the line with that platform that are pretty, really, like really good. Yeah. That have been hidden inside the data, hidden inside the UI. The point is, is like that needs to be a part of your overall components. One of the first things that we install is that in combination with a couple of different, you know, ways in which we get that data, you know, all along the lines of still in line with privacy policies and in line with all the other issues that are in the EU, United States, California specifically. The point is, is like, but it's only gives you a partial story. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that I think there's an over-reliance on Everyone wants to get attribution 100% accurate, and it's never actually going to happen. And I think that is something that you have to have a holistic 30,000-foot view. You have to have a software that plugs into all of the platforms that you're using and at least gives you a foggy idea at best. Because if you're going from Google to Facebook to TikTok to Snapchat and trying to compare them all in their own silos, you're just going to drive yourself insane. Yeah, you're right. So, all right. Well, that is uh, as many <laughs> trends as we can get to in the short period of time that we have here. That'll shape your marketing in 2024. We'll continue this list on a future episode. Of course, make sure that uh, wherever you do uh, listen to podcasts, that's just, that's custom, just rolling around and all his money. <laughs> you heard that. He's just he's just rolling around in coins. So you got to go see $1. that. Right? <laughs> One, that's all the money he has to his name right there. You got to see that at uh, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube on our YouTube channel. Check out all our YouTubes over there. And uh, of course, if uh, you are into following us on our socials, follow me on LinkedIn as well as Kasim on all socials at Kasim Aslam. So go back and listen to previous episodes. And of course, we will leave all the links, which we have quite a few for this week's show, 
in the show notes over at perpetualtraffic.com. So on behalf of my awesome co-host, Kasim Aslam, peace. Until next show, see ya. Thank you.